I'm not that fixated on tools. I've always, I always try to say, if we didn't have electronic music, we'd be making music in another way by banging on a log or something, or singing, or we'd be doing something, you know. And I say to my younger friends and colleagues that the tools don't mean nothing without the idea. So many great records have been made with, with, with very simple tools, where the very fact that we don't have many options forces us to commit and explore deeply the few options that we do have. And that, to me, that's a magical and highly creative process. I have got more gear than I need. I've got a lot more equipment than I need, even though I've reduced my set of tools massively since the 90s. And I realize that I fell in love with the Neuro Rack, I suppose, the new version of Modular, again, slowly, inspired by Schneidersladen here in Berlin. And I have settled with one manufacturer, actually, in hardware terms, which is Make Noise. For some reason, uh, my, my friend and mentor, Daniel Miller, um, showed me some Make Noise stuff in his Modular Rack, and I kind of fell in love with it. And uh, I started off with one module, and I gradually bought one module after the other. I'm not one of these guys who said, OK, I'm buying a system. I tried to do that at the beginning. I had a budget. When I, tried to, when I started to get into Eurorack, I had a budget in mind. And I thought, OK, I'm going to go to Schneider's and I'm going to spend my money and buy a system. And I couldn't do it. I went like three times. I was just so confused. I didn't know what to do. And Daniel suggested, I should say, he suggested that I buy a rack and put one module in it, which was a very good suggestion. Because, uh, you know, just a, not a very big rack, but a, and, and just build it gradually based on feelings. And essentially, that's what I did after a bit of a couple of mistakes. So I, anyway, I landed with Make Noise. So now the, the, my main tools are uh, you know, lots of the make noise modules. Um, and I want to go deeper and deeper and deeper with those tools to become more proficient and more excited and explore new boundaries. I feel those tools I, give me a huge potential. So it's not like I think I need a wall of, of modular stuff in order to fulfill my modular dream. The great thing about modular is everyone's got their own approach. Some people have modulars the size of this room. Some people have just a little one, one little rack. And, and you can make great music with either, and you can make terrible music with either. And you can finish records with either, and you can fail to finish records with either. I'm more thinking, well, if I can keep it fairly small and compact and explore it very deeply, which I was forced to do by rehearsing, actually, for our gig. Because I started rehearsing because Nick was coming over, and he's a proficient DJ, and, I, and, I, and he's done a lot more live performance than I had. I thought I'd better practice on my own so that I could keep up to speed with Nick. And in that practicing, I went far deeper into my little modular system than I'd ever been before, which was fantastic for me. And I just realized how deep I actually could go. I think there are real dangers and in endless presets on, on uh, creative dangers, I'm, I'm not, not commercial dangers, creative dangers. I know that, you know, a lot of people want to buy a software synth and they want a lot of great sounds to be in there already. They want, dare I say it, Diva to be full of great bass sounds. Cut that out. <laughs> And or, or that uh, yeah fine, uh, and they want and they want um, you know they want to open up a, a, a plugin and they want to be blown away by the wonderful work that Howard or someone has done to make all these presets that they can use immediately. That's not my thing, you know. If I un if I halfway understand a software synth, I'd rather start almost with a blank canvas with maybe just a sine wave playing or something, and then create something truly new and original. Now, obviously, I don't, we don't always have the time for that. Sometimes in the rush of production, some people work for TV, some people work for film, some people are trying to finish a mix very quickly, and all they need is an extra kick drum just to punch it up. And at times like that, knowing where to go in your 
toolkit to find those sounds is incredibly useful. I get that as well. But I really do, I got overloaded, I suppose, by software. You know, I, I mean, I do, I have a massive amount of software, uh, and it's, but I feel I have more than I need, and I'm, I'm very aware of the dangers of the huge, you, you know, we, it started with the, it started as soon as we had synths, hardware synths, where you could save sounds. When you could save about eight, it was okay. But co very quickly, the manufacturers started delivering hardware synthesizers that could save 8,000 sounds. So we've all sat in the studio when actually what we want to do is be creative and scrolled through sounds. And it's horrible. Because after about, you know, suddenly you think, what are we doing? We had a vibe, we had a buzz going, we were making something, and now for like 20 minutes, all we've done is like scroll through sounds. So to me, there's a creative danger in that, that, which is one of the reasons I fell in love with modular, because my, the, my modular doesn't make any noise until I start hooking it up. And that, to me, that's my thing, that's one of my, in my own music, and hopefully more and more with, um, working in production and collaboration with other artists, that's something that I can bring to the table. Having said that, uh, my, mix, my mix room, which is where I do a lot of my commissioned work, is very, it, I have an analog summing side to the mix room. I go through a wonderful valve mixer and then back into the computer. And there I use a lot of plugins, massive amount of plugins, which is like a miracle to me and a big help in my commercial work. And there the fact that I can save all the work <coughs> is hugely important because everything has to be recallable, you know. And I can see that if you're a composer working for film or television, that might be the same. They, you, they want to be able to recall all the sounds and maybe say, change the tempo. I mean, I've done a few film soundtracks as a sound engineer and a co-producer kind of thing. And that happens often when the film gets recut, the composer has to like change everything, you know. And there, the ability of having stored sounds is incredibly useful, incredibly useful. So, so it's a two-edged sword, it's a battle all the time. But I don't mind that, I'm comfortable with conflict and I'm comfortable with paradox because I know that life is paradox now. I can love you and I can hate you at the same time and that's okay. It's what, you know, I can, the more I look into life, the more I see paradox and the more I understand it and the more I try to embrace it. You see, my left brain doesn't like paradox. My left brain likes analysis and precision and predictability. But my right brain, which I'm trying to open out into the cosmos again and, and give more time for, my right brain embraces paradox, synthesis, creating. My right brain has no problem with saying black and white. But my left brain wants to say black or white. Uh, and you know, so, so, and, and similarly, my working life is a paradox. I love software plugins and software synths, and I hate them. I've always held up UE plugins to be great sounding uh, synth plugins from the very beginning, long before it, it turned into the massive empire that it now is UE. But, so I was always a fan of, of, of what the sound of the stuff and the creativity and what could be done. So I've known those for quite a long time. But uh, cut, it was about two years ago I was working with uh, Janie Climac producing uh, an EP for her, with her, here in, in Berlin. I, I mixed it in London, I think. It was at that time that I was singing the praises of the old synths that you can't save, and the new modulars that you can't save the sound. And then Urs was like, you, I could see his, you know, obviously he's such a bright guy, I could see his mind going, and, he, and like, almost the next day he said, well, here you go then, here's a version of Ace where I've disabled saving. So I used it for three or four times, or I would make a sound, and then I could bounce. You know, I could bounce the audio and I had to bounce, it was just like a hardware synth that you can't save. You record it, you know, and, but, but uh, we didn't carry that on through the different versions. It was like a, a mind, it was a thought experiment, you know. And funnily enough, 
because it was software, it didn't, it was an interesting thought experiment, but it doesn't, it's not, it, it, the outcome of the experiment for me was that it doesn't work. If it's, it's like so many of the great records were made on four track as we, or eight track as we know. Endless talk about it, blah, blah, blah. You know, you, know, you can love the Beatles or you can hate them. So, you know, the Beach Boys, whatever. So many great records are made like that or, or great jazz records recorded straight to stereo, incredible Miles Davis work and stuff. So you, so you think, okay, it's easy. So, so eight tracks the thing, right? That's creative, we've decided. The first album I ever made from beginning to end was Metamatic by John Fox back in the early 80s, very late 70s. And that was done on an eight track analog tape machine with one synth, Arp Odyssey, one string synth, one string machine, Elka, uh, one drum machine, CR78, one sequencer, Arp, Arp, 16 step sequencer, three gate, three bus, three gate buses on each step, and um, MXR flanger, I think. That was it. We had a bit of reverb in the studio, and you know, so very limited toolkit. So you think, okay, let's do that in the computer. Let's, we can, I, in my computer we'll do, I don't know, 20,000 tracks. Let's not, let's just limit it to eight tracks. But it becomes a fake, because you save as, for instance. Okay, we've got eight tracks, they're all full. We want to redo the vocal. So we're gonna wipe that vocal off. No one does that, you playlist it. You know, you save as, because you just do, because, because it, it, you're too nervous. And it, so that's a different, that's an authenticity thing for me. So the, the mind experiment with the version of Ace that didn't save didn't really work because once it's in the computer, you want to have the preset, you want to have the option to save different versions. I find it hard to fool myself with the, with the computer. I've never managed to say, well, let's make an eight track production because someone at some stage always loses their nerve and they do a save as, and then it's no longer really eight tracks. You know, you got, you, you, many of the software, you, many people these days are too young to have ever worked on tape, but that happened on tape all the time. And I'm not talking about the sound of tape because that's another thing. I'll, but for me, the psychology of it, I've been in the studio, and many of us have from my generation, with artists of all levels uh, that, where there's a, there might be a 16-track tape or a 24-track tape that's full, right? And the artist comes in and they might say, I'm not happy with my lead vocal on this song. So your only choice, and you go, okay, and the only choice is to wipe off the lead something. Usually, you wipe off the lead vocal that was there. So at that moment, the artist, everyone, has to raise their game so massively because th there's no safety net. The lead vocal that is there is gone. You hit that red button, it's gone. So then they've got to deliver. It might have been really good. They might have worked their ass off to get that lead vocal, but they're not happy. That's, all, that's an incredibly powerful moment. You know, the red light goes, it's gone, the other one. So you've got to do better. And that doesn't exist in, in uh, DAWs. It just doesn't exist. Everyone playlists. So it's like, well, I think I might be able to do better. That's different. That's so different from saying, wipe the motherfucker off. I am now going to do it. You watch. Listen to this. That's so different. I love learning and I embraced computers really early, uh, uh, which was seems like ridiculous to say now, but there was a time when there were no, almost no computers in music. There was a time when there were no computers in music. So I was very excited by the emergence of powerful digital processing. When we could put audio inside the computer, I, was, I spent a lot of money. I spent a lot of my Erasure record royalties. Thanks, Andy and Vince, for that. I spent a lot of them on early Macintosh and DigiDesign systems because I used a Studio Vision, which was an incredible piece of software made by Opcode. What that was essentially was a MIDI sequencer with audio inside it, and that, it's, it's hard to explain now. That was mind-blowing mind-blowing audio that had always been linear on tape suddenly went random access and and that had huge benefits and like i tried to explain earlier it had huge 
it has huge dangers as well. But it's obviously also hugely liberating, you know, incredibly. Especially, where, you know, obviously it's gone another level now. The early studio vision simply played the audio clips. Now with Ableton or something, or Logic, you know, it's all elastic, isn't it? The audio, you can do anything with it, which is incredibly creative. So I love learning and I, I have, I keep trying different things, I suppose. One of the things I did recently, about three months ago or four months ago, <clears throat> I, I started thinking about how other people work and how I might want to work and I completely redesigned my mixing template in a way that the audio flows through my virtual studio in a completely different way and that was so wonderfully productive and inspiring for me um, that it really uh, gave me like a creative kick up the ass and made me uh, refreshed, it's like refreshing a web page. Um, one of the things I did was when the mix comes back into the computer, I've got four parallel, four compressors in parallel on the mix when it comes back into my computer. One of which actually is a Pressvec, which I found an like, incredibly powerful tool because it's so, uh, has so many colors. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it's, it, it, it's delivered with lots of presets, so you can, sadly, so you can get going quickly. Um, but it's very deep. It, it, it's not attempting to, to emulate. It seems like it's not said, well, let's just model that style of compression or that style of compression or that. It's like incredibly deep because you can try different routings and try different saturations and try different kinds of modeling and try. I, you know, what's it, I don't know, uh, negative feedback or positive feedback or whatever it's called. There's lots of knobs you can turn, basically, to totally change the character. So I think that's, an, uh, I mean, that's one of the later plugins that you guys make. I think it's really, really awesome. And Satin, actually. That's one of yours, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, I just want to make sure I'm saying the right thing. <laughs> no. and, and Satin I really embraced as well. I love the tape emulations. I use them a lot in mixing. And I, I'm, I'm kind of... I use them quite subtly so that, in other words, if I put one tape emulation on in high quality, obviously sometimes I use a, I hate this word, but sometimes I use a lo-fi tape for an echo effect or something, that's wonderful. But I use a lot of tape in very high quality, like old school, like we tried to use tape to sound great. And if I put one plug in on, I wouldn't guarantee that I could tell if it was on or not because it's subtle. And I, I, you know, I'm not like, oh, night and day, I've totally changed this. But, but if I put 24 on, or 48, or if I've got tape on the output of every bus, which I very often do now, then I, somehow I feel good about it. And then clients come in and they go, oh, that sounds like music. That's one of the things the tape plugins. It it's, might be my generation. Uh, clearly, it's doing something technical, and it's pulling off these super fast high transients to some extent. It's softening the transients, which is upping your headroom and making everything feel a bit more relaxed and a bit more expansive. You know, I've got a massive monitor system in my room. I don't use it loud all the time, but I need to be able to crank my barefoots and have it really pumping out at me and not hurt me and sound like embracing. I want to be embraced. I don't want to be hammered down. Oh, and then we had the thing about the diva bass. Yeah. We should use that, <laughs> for sure.